Actually Speaking, Episode 6, Challenge and Support. Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 6 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Moraz, and today we'll be exploring the topic of challenge and support. The concept of challenge and support is fairly simple. It basically states that for growth to occur, an individual needs to be presented with a balanced amount of both challenge and support. Specifically, the challenge a person receives sets a learning process in motion and provides the motivation for a response. The support helps ensure a successful and constructive response to the challenge. Support alone produces laziness. Challenge alone can be harmful, but together, challenge and support can create constructive growth experiences. In higher education, which is where my career path lies, we use the concept of challenge and support extensively because it is so important to the development of students. It's implemented both on an individual level as well as in the construction of programs and services. In this context, we try to challenge a student's thinking and ask them to do things that they may be uncomfortable with but are necessary for growth. But in addition, the students are supported along the way so that they feel safe and know that they have someone they can turn to. It's actually the basis for student affairs and most support services at any university. In fact, it's often built into the very structure of the institution. For example, academics, being away from home, exposure to various forms of diversity are all challenges a student faces. Counseling centers, residential life, career centers, and student organizations provide the support. The result, ideally, is to graduate a student that not only obtains a degree, but achieves a level of personal growth and maturity from the experience as well. Challenge and support isn't just a concept limited to education. It's really applicable to any stage of life. Parenting is a great example where we do it almost intuitively with young children. Tying shoes, riding a bike, learning to swim, potty training are very challenging activities for kids. Too much challenge and they'll eventually give up and refuse to learn. Too much support and we'll be changing diapers for a very long time. So we take it one step at a time, reassure them, allow for mistakes, and motivate them to keep trying and practice until they get it. Basically, our children know that they aren't alone as they learn. We support them through the challenge. And when they finally master the skill, it's one of the best feelings a parent can have. And it doesn't stop there. Challenge and support is the basis for coaching and mentoring. It's at the heart of good professional development in the workplace. Anyone who manages employees might recognize it in the form of direction and resources. Similarly, counseling, therapy, recovery programs, and many other services all operate in some fashion on this concept. Now, there's an additional factor to the concept of challenge and support, which is helpful to note. And that's the concept of readiness. Simply put, a person can't grow in an area until they're physically, mentally, or emotionally ready. You can't teach quantum physics to a first grader. Well, you can try, but it's probably not a very good idea. As skeptics, this is a concept we need to harness and make intuitive in our interactions with non-skeptics. It's an extremely versatile concept that can be implemented on many levels. We can incorporate it in our interactions with family and friends, within our own community, within organizational structures, conferences, public relations, and general outreach. Given the challenging nature of skepticism and critical thinking, I personally think this should be at the core of everything we do. When it comes to the concept of challenge and support, I think the skeptic community leans too heavily on the side of challenge. We're very good at challenging someone's way of thinking, but not as skilled at supporting non-skeptics in their own growth and learning. Presenting others with too much challenge only serves the purpose of turning them away and probably forcing them to cling more firmly to their unfounded beliefs. So what does it look like when we expose non-skeptics to too much challenge? Well, it's certainly going to vary and be different for different individuals, groups, or communities. Looking at myself and my own interactions with family and friends, I can easily see ways in which I'm guilty of too much challenge. I'm being too challenging when I expect people to have the same level of scientific literacy and understanding as I do. I'm being too challenging when I overload people with research, scientific facts, 
and assume that they're capable or even interested in digesting that level of information. I'm being too challenging when I bombard people with links, references, articles, books, or any information instead of engaging with them in a more comfortable and conversational manner. I'm being too challenging when I insult them for their beliefs, when I expect them to take a more academic, scientific approach to every problem, and I'm being too challenging when I lead them to believe that they need to change in order to continue their relationship with me. Now, by the same token, I can block learning by being too supportive. And this usually comes about when I'm too tired, nervous, or just reluctant to confront certain issues. Or I just don't have enough confidence in my position or I'm protecting a relationship too much. I'm being too supportive when I accommodate misinformation and don't say anything because it would be disruptive. I'm being too supportive when I allow my silence to imply agreement. I'm being too supportive when somebody spreads false information and I don't speak up. And I'm being too supportive when I treat all views as valid and take a neutral ground. Now, take a minute and think about these extremes. I'm sure they're not as rare as we'd like them to be in our own interactions. Whether an aggressive skeptic or a closet skeptic, neither is likely to be very effective in promoting critical thinking. So why is a balanced approach of challenge and support so important to the advancement of critical thinking and skepticism among family and friends? Simply put, being proven wrong in a forceful manner is mentally and emotionally traumatic. It's embarrassing and humiliating. And a funny thing happens when a person's back is up against that factual wall. They often retreat more deeply into irrationality in order to defend themselves and their beliefs. We've all experienced this, and we know what it feels like when we believe in something strongly for a very long time only to be proven wrong. It's embarrassing, humiliating, and nobody likes to go through that. Yet, when we interact with others, we forget this simple fact. We think that confronting someone head-on, forcefully, and slapping them down in their beliefs is somehow going to produce a positive change. It usually doesn't. It typically has the opposite effect and digs people in more firmly into their beliefs because they become defensive. They instinctively protect themselves when presented with too much challenge. And they'll do whatever they need to to protect their position regardless of facts, even if they know they are wrong. People experience more constructive and effective growth when they feel good about themselves and their learning environment. And we can achieve this by paying attention to our interactions with others and offering a balanced amount of challenge and support. Now, implementing the concept of challenge and support is tricky because the key to its success lies in the balance. And its implementation changes with each situation and with each individual. Really, the ways in which challenge and support can be implemented are endless. I wish there were a clearly structured approach to take, but this particular skill takes practice to master. But when you get the hang of this concept, it'll become intuitive, and you'll find that people begin listening. Your information hits its mark. And whether or not people agree with you, they'll begin to trust you. And those strained lines of communication will begin to open up. Now, the challenge that skepticism presents to others is pretty much self-explanatory. The missing element is often the support, so let's focus on that. Here are some examples of things that I do when interacting with family and friends to inject a healthy dose of support to my already challenged, strained relationships. These six examples are in no way complete, but they represent elements of support that I found to be most effective. Number one. Speak in plain language. When talking with friends and family or anyone of a non-skeptic or non-scientific persuasion, it's important to speak in a voice and language that's casual, conversational, and accessible. We're all familiar with that stereotypical image of a scientist struggling to convey what they consider to be very basic scientific concepts, only to be interrupted with the request, uh, could you say that in English? For many, this is a case where language presents too much challenge and you can be tuned out in a variety of creative ways. If you have a hard time relating, imagine someone giving you directions in a language you don't speak. You may recognize a word or two, but the overall meaning would be lost to you. You could just walk away in frustration, but to save yourself some embarrassment, you might simply nod in agreement, pretend to understand, and thank the person before heading off oblivious to what they just said. Trust me, many are quite good at faking understanding in order to get you to leave them alone. Being skeptically or scientifically bilingual is one way we can show support through our communication. Let the challenge lie in the information itself, not the delivery. Number two, 
allow people freedom to make mistakes. If I'm going to challenge someone on a certain position, belief, or set of facts, then I need to show an equal level of support by allowing them room for mistakes. I can't expect people to be perfect in their thinking. It's challenging enough to be confronted with being wrong on an issue, and that challenge can become overwhelming if we expect perfection in their response. Being corrected and rethinking a position or belief is messy. It's emotional, confusing, and it rarely happens fully during a brief period of conversation. We can be supportive by allowing people space to grasp and fumble with a new perspective on any given issue. Personally, I really enjoy allowing non-skeptic space, flexibility, and time to rethink their position and digest whatever information I may have shared. If they grasp and genuinely consider a portion of what I've shared, that's a success for me, and I'm happy to pick up the conversation another time so as not to overwhelm them. If they reflect back to me an understanding of a new concept that isn't entirely accurate, I'll often let it go in support of the progress already made. And very often, I'll actually share this flexibility with people directly by saying to them, hey, this is confusing stuff. It took me a while to grasp it as well. Give yourself some time and think about it. Number three, don't project a position of superiority. In my opinion, knowledge and intelligence, in a relative sense, are intimidating for most people. Being the first in my family to go to college, I learned this fact the hard way as I watched certain family and friends become more distant as I advanced in my education. It's the basis for many perceptions of academic elitism, snobbery, or detachment from the quote-unquote real world. It's why many people, upon meeting someone of significant status, often compliment them by saying how down-to-earth or easy to talk to they turned out to be when they actually met. Like it or not, we live in a very status-driven world, and this can work against us in our interactions if we're not careful. There are lots of ways we do this. We can do it directly by flaunting our title, degrees, and accomplishments, but I find that I often do it in more subtle ways. I often bombard people with links, papers, articles, books, research, etc., which flaunt my knowledge on a subject, intimidates, and signals a smackdown for anyone that challenges me. That's not to say I'm not right. It's just intimidating to others. Like hanging a Do Not Disturb sign on my door and wondering why no one visits. I make every effort to distill information down to basic concepts and conclusions in order to share it in a more conversational manner. Then, if anyone wants more information and details, or perhaps see original sources, I'm happy to provide it. But that's just one example. We all need to be vigilant for subtle ways we may be projecting an image of superiority. Number four, share your own mistakes, embarrassments, and growth. One way I used to help ease embarrassment and the sting of being wrong or making mistakes is to open up my own process of growth and share it with others. I share examples of how I've been wrong, how I've been challenged, how I've learned, been guilty of thinking in a similar way, misinformed or embarrassed. It supports others by pointing out that we're no different in this struggle and no better, just at a different place. This is a very simple strategy, but extremely effective, and any of you with kids know how powerful a form of support it can be. Many of us know the embarrassment and fear a young child has when having an accident at school. It's traumatic, it's embarrassing, and they often feel they've let us down when we show up with a change of clothes. But we also know that look of utter relief, comfort, and security when we say, you know, the same thing happened to me when I was your age. With an ample supply of mistakes under my belt, I really don't have much of a problem finding the right one to share, although it does sting to relive old embarrassments, but it's worth it. Number five, find common ground by looking at a person's intent and not just their actions. For example, take someone who is concerned about vaccinations and the harm they feel it might present to their children. They may be wrong and misinformed, but that doesn't mean that their actions aren't based on the best of intentions. A way of being supportive is to acknowledge the care and concern they are exhibiting for the safety of their family. That concern may be based on fears that are completely unfounded and should be challenged, but it is still a strong, positive parental act to protect children from harm, whether real or simply perceived. You might say something to them like, I completely understand how hard and confusing it can be to know what's in the best interest of our kids. I've looked into the issue myself and decided to vaccinate. 
In the end, I simply felt more confident basing my decision on sound medical research and facts. If you're interested, let me know. I have some great reliable sources of information I can share. It's good to be cautious when it comes to the health of our children, and there is no harm in acknowledging that fact. And by using a supportive approach, you aren't tearing down their whole concept of being a good parent and bruising their self-image. Instead, you're supporting their current efforts to make the best health decisions for their family by providing additional factual information. Number six, remind people that their choices are their own. Let people know that you realize and accept this simple fact stated up front, that your only intent is to add to their knowledge in order to help them make more informed decisions. It's a simple means of support, but probably the one that's the hardest to accomplish for most people. Promoting critical thinking is hard. It's always much easier to simply tell someone what to do. But respecting a person's right to make their own choices is one of the most effective ways of diffusing resistance and showing support. Think of it like a salesperson at a department store. Which would you have a more positive response to? The salesperson who comes over, gives their pitch, follows you from aisle to aisle, and has no intention of leaving until a sale is made? Or... The salesperson who simply introduces himself, provides basic information, and lets you know where you can find them if you have any questions. People are much more likely to avail themselves of resources if they feel free to do so on their own. The incorporation of challenge and support into our interactions with others promotes not only growth, but a sense of safety in learning and the sharing of information. It builds trust among family and friends and makes us approachable despite our differences. And it does this based on a very simple premise, that people experience more constructive and effective growth when they feel good about themselves and their learning environment. But this isn't a formulaic process. This isn't something we can distill down into a clear-cut approach for every situation. It's more of an art and a skill that will strengthen and become intuitive with practice. We can condition ourselves to look at our interactions from a challenge and support perspective, but how we apply it is going to vary from situation to situation. Challenge to one person might simply be coming out as an atheist to your family. That in itself may be more than enough challenge for your family members. The support you provide might simply be in letting them know that you aren't seeking to strip them of their own beliefs, that you respect their choices and only seek acceptance for who you are. That is challenge and support. And it will change over time, but at that moment, for that situation, it represents the best balance. Hopefully, you're beginning to see that there is much more to civility than simply being nice. It's about being effective, and it's more complex than people realize. If we ever hope to spread the values of skepticism and promote true critical thinking, we need to stop talking with each other and start engaging those outside the skeptic community in positive, constructive, and effective ways. That's the challenge that we face, both as individuals and as a community. I hope this podcast offers some means of support. If you have questions, comments, or would like to share your own tips and ideas on living skeptically, send them to actuallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash factually. Thanks for listening.